Um, thanks very much for coming in. Um, I had COVID a month ago, so I get a little bit nervous. But uh, want to thank you all for uh, the work you do every day. Um, under enormous pressure with inadequate funding, and that's what I want to discuss. Um, and thank you for traveling long distances to get here. Uh, bottom line is that in a rural state like ours, when somebody dials 911, pretty good idea to have somebody answer the call and get to the house uh, in as short a time as possible. And I sometimes think, you know, when we talk about the health care crisis in America, something that I get involved in a whole lot because I'm chairman of the committee that deals with it. We talk about the high cost of health care. We talk about the uh, inadequate number of doctors and nurses and dentists that we have. But we don't talk about what first responders do. And at the end of the day, if I have some kind of medical emergency in my home in a rural community, if I don't get the care I need as soon as possible, that's going to have a significant impact on my outcomes. Right? And I think we don't pay enough attention to that. And I think we have a very bifurcated system, which I want to talk about, uh, how we improve it. I know some of you are paid, some of you are volunteers, some of you are in fire departments, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have taken this issue seriously over the last couple of years. We've managed to get some, not enough money, uh, into the fire academy. Who's with the fire academy? All right. So you're going to double the number of cadets we have? Is that right? Working on it. All right. So that's a big deal. We didn't, you know, there are a lot of young people uh, who might want to uh, work at volunteer fire departments. You haven't been able to train an adequate number. Is, is that a fair statement? All right, so hopefully we'll be able to do more than that. I don't know if you know that we got some money for Dr. Wilson, who couldn't be here with us now. He'll be here later, actually. He's doing a great job. And he's going to be training uh, paramedics for virtually, for very low cost. One of the impediments has been if I'm going to be a volunteer and I have to pay thousands of dollars to get training, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So we got him some money, and I think he is developing a program uh, which is starting off well. We got some money for Waterbury here. Senator Maggie Burt is hey. one of the students in that program. How's it going? It's going great. Thank okay, you very much. good. And uh, we got some money for Waterbury to hopefully help build a new facility there. So we want to stay on this issue. I want to get your ideas as to what kind of federal programs could be most useful. Uh, and how we can uh, improve the situation in Vermont. So it's a, just fire away and um, tell me what's on your mind. I, I, I start off with, and, and, and then I also want to talk about, you know, uh, emerge, uh, EMT services often run out of fire departments, and that's an historical thing. But fighting a fire or dealing with chemicals in a house that fire departments do it, which is enormously important, is a very different uh, situation than going out for somebody who's overdosing with drugs. What's the connection? How do we develop a rational system? Is what we have rational now? I talked to the um, fire chief here in Burlington. I think he said, Katie, what, the three quarters of the calls now are uh, m medically related. That's a different world than fighting a fire, right? Fighting a fire is enormously important. We've got to be prepared to do that. What's the connection? So let's think short term what we do to help immediately. Let's think longer term what is a more rational system. All right? That's kind of what's on my mind. Uh, what do you got? Senator? Yes. Nice to see you today. Good to see you, too. I haven't seen you in a while. We, it's been a little while. We get, uh, we get, we've been getting together for, what, 20 years or something? At least. Yes, usually in Washington. So, the one thing is it's not exactly short term what it is, but the extender bill runs out, and this, this year you haven't signed on to the bill with S3236, which it always gets passed at the end of the year, but the extenders end for ambulance. And the Senate bill that you have actually adds a little bit more than it was before 3. It goes to 4.3, I think, for the uh, rural. Okay, we'll thing. be on it. Good, so thanks. appreciate that. Uh, the other thing is on the workforce bill, if you could, I know you, you, if you can have hearings that include EMS, but add some language somehow that adds EMS for the future. So they right, that bill has not been completed yet, and that's a good point. All right, we, my committee, we deal with apprenticeship programs. We are working on a big one, 
which absolutely should include uh, health care and EMS. Good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, why don't we start short term and then we'll go to longer term. Senator. Dan, uh, Dean. S930, uh, which is the uh, bill that would make cancer a line of duty death, uh, which would put uh, people uh, that die of cancer, um, their family would be eligible for the PSOB. That's been almost a year now since it was introduced. We'd like, love to have you both uh, sign on to that. Okay, good, thanks. And hopefully we could get that through because it was it's a retroactive bill. Um, and it would certainly help families. We have a family in Addison County that uh, the chief died of brain cancer, uh, started out with lung cancer. And we think it's related to the work that he was doing? Yeah, and uh, after 45 years of his family, uh, him and his family giving to the, to the service, uh, to be ineligible for, for a benefit just doesn't make any sense. You're right. Really to get that question. Okay. Now, I don't have to tell you that the uh, Congress today is not the world's most efficient operation. No. Um, and we have to, when we have a budget, we have to extend it until continuing a resolution until March. But hopefully there will be a decent budget and some of these things can be included. Okay. Other thoughts? Well, let them get around the table. We're uh, in St. Johnsbury. We're actually right now have been working with our local EMS agency to combine our two services because there's been a drastic falling off of staff availability, people that are interested in this line of work. And so. Let me ask you why is, Brad, why is you're not, why are you not, I know there's a labor shortage all over the state. Why are people not attracted to the line of work? Um, I think there's a variety of different reasons, but one of the most glaring really is it's just when you look at the wages, it's just not competitive. It's not close to competitive, and there's people that leave the service that go to New Hampshire because you can get quite a bit more in your salary, and they go to other states. All right, let's stay on that point. Is that, a, is that an issue that all you guys are running into? Yeah, yes. the, the wages we've increased our wages over 25 percent in the last year and of course the payments from Medicare and Medicaid can't keep up with that but the real problem is in a rural state like Vermont where you have uh, an aging population with not as many young people staying is one thing but then once you start to train them into the EMS actually a lot of hospitals because of their shortage are hiring them okay. we've lost 17 I think in the last two years you've lost 17 yeah that's what's you know, they're moving up, but we can't afford to pay what the hospitals pay. Is that a statewide problem? Yeah, like Dan, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I, I think we've certainly seen that. Um, I think certainly retention is not all about money, um, but it is uh, when, you, when there are exit points that give you a lot more money in other places, nursing, working in the hospital as an EMT, I think that's always going to be a, a pull away from our system. So uh, we've seen that not just with you, Jim, but with lots of other services as well. So if I wanted to drive an ambulance for you, how much are you going to pay me? Well, to start not as a 24-hour course is $19 an hour. You become an EMT, it's twenty-one fifty an hour. You're an AEMT, it's twenty-four fifty an hour. A paramedic, this is just the starting wages, is $26, $29 an hour. So we, the pay isn't terrible, but again, when you're comp in competition with the hospital next year, it gets, gets harder. And it's not putting anything on the hospital, but we have to have enough money to be able it's to pay enough resource. to retain them. Regionally, our, our, to answer your question for Central Vermont, our regional first in the door uh, basic level provider is getting 15 to $16 an hour. There are signs on our Barry Montpelier Road advertising for 17 to 18 dollars an hour just to flip burgers yeah. but these are the people who we are putting our communities our neighbors our lives in their hands to get us to the hospital when need and we can't pay them more all right well that's one indication of a crisis in a system that is not working well mm -hmm. the cost of readiness too you know the cost of what the cost of readiness so our our service has a call volume of about 800 calls that doesn't mean we don't still need to pay those folks who are responding to those calls. So the income that we're getting from the calls that we're going on doesn't supplement the cost right. that we need to pay our employees. All right, now I understand there's different reimbursement rates for Medicare, for Medicaid, for 
private insurance, and what happens if somebody doesn't have any insurance? You eat it? Yeah, very often. You send a bill and then you write it off. <laughs> Is that a decent percentage of your calls that no, cause people don't have any insurance? Depends on your community. It can be as high as 30 to 35 percent. Wow. There are some agencies in, in central Vermont, more of the uh, city or large town agencies that are writing off between 25 and 35 percent just because they don't see it. All right, let me ask you, uh, you know, what we are seeing in Burlington, what we're seeing in Vermont, we're seeing all over this country is fentanyl and, you know, but we have hundreds of overdoses. Who would have believed it? I mean, if we were here 10 years ago, we would not be saying that in the state of Vermont, this small state, we'd have several hundred people dying of overdoses, right? Nobody would have dreamed that. And that's about the national average. We're losing about 100,000 people a year. All right, who wants to talk a little bit about what's going on there? How do we, how are we responding to it? Who wants to say a word on that? Yeah, Dan? I will, so Senator, 100%, 121,000 actually this year is nationally. Two, two, uh, 2023 number, yeah. Um, so, so I think EMS has a lot of potential in that frame. Um, you saw during the pandemic the uh, capabilities of us stepping yep. up to do I vaccinations did. Did. and uh, testing and all that, and people at this table here certainly were deeply involved in that. Um, I think there's some really interesting, we were just down at a National Governors Association collaborative meeting talking about what EMS can do. We talked about the leave behind kits, the connection to resourcing. Uh, one of the big challenges that we have is um, some of the confidentiality requirements around uh, 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 this stuff like HIPAA and, and some of the other uh, legislation around that, which means that if Drew goes and takes care of a person, who overdosed and the guy says, you know, I, I don't want to be referred to treatment, we're done, dead in the water. Can't can't give his name off to somebody else, to even a recovery coach to call him up and say, hey, have you thought about coming in? There's even some more challenges. That's pretty irrational, is it not? Well, what's, what's especially, especially irrational is the notion that he says, uh, uh, yeah, I'd like to get a, a, a call from a recovery coach and we can't share his data yeah. from our state system to the to the substance abuse advocacy groups. And that's been a significant impediment to doing any of that sort of thing. So there's some of that pieces, but I think there's what, what you're sitting around the table and uh, uh, I wanna go back to what Maggie said, Senator, and um, she said, we don't get paid for readiness. The, the model of reimbursement is flawed in that you get paid only for putting the patient in the back of the stretcher and taking them to the ambulance. Except and you don't get paid if you don't transport. Yeah. So that means when Maggie goes out and, and gives that person Narcan on the scene, wakes him up to a point of consciousness and decision-making capability, and he says, I don't wanna go, she's eating the cost of that, of that call. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> that's a fundamental challenge there as well. But the other piece that I think weaves into this is um, that system, the way we're reimbursed right now favors the, the agencies that have high call volume, right? We, with a lot of transports, you have more income coming in. When an agency like Maggie says 800 calls a year, that's difficult. That's difficult to cover their bills. If we could find some things that are reimbursable for her to do um, in the downtime, like mm -hmm. give vaccines, give Eventually COVID testing, type stuff. Think about some of the uh, some of the other models around opioid addiction, and, and quite frankly, about a lot of other things. So the community paramedic, the mobile integrated health model. Let's make sure that her people are being reimbursed and doing good for their community, and available for emergencies at the same time. I think in a month or so, within the next month, I'm going to go to Baltimore, where Johns Hopkins has a nurse outreach program. They're literally knocking on doors mm -hmm. in their underserved areas. You know, trying to get to people before they end up in an emergency room. That makes sense. That type of thing. You should also go to Bennington and talk to Bill Camarda and Bennington Rescue because they're doing a very similar outreach. Really? I didn't know that. Okay. Look, I don't have to. You don't want to hear a two-hour speech from me. Uh, the healthcare system is dysfunctional. We tried, by the way, on my committee, to put a whole lot of money to revolutionize primary healthcare in America, to make sure that we spend our money keeping people healthy responding to people's crises rather than letting them get sick and then do you know major operations in the hospital. That is what we do right now. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done, but I agree with you. I think you guys have, well, what do you think? I mean, is Dan right about that? Can we be doing more outreach stuff? 
Who wants to say a word on that, please? So, so we're doing some of that now. Tell me where you're from. Uh, uh, Rescue Inc. down in Brattleboro. Brattleboro, okay. Um, so not only during the pandemic did we, you know, do the outreach with um, vaccinations and monoclonal antibodies, but we're active in the mobile integrated health environment, um, going out and seeing patients um, ahead of um, appointments at the hospital in order to help keep them out of um, emergency rooms and try to help them make the right decisions towards. All right, you know, we also got some money for, is that community health center, FQHC, going to be, a, they moving along? Uh, they're moving along. They're not active yet, but they're right. getting there eventually. That'll be, I, I think, help to win them county, yeah? Absolutely. Okay. Access to primary care is, is critically important, and I think EMS can play a huge role in that. You know, we are the kind of the ultimate safety net. Yep. Um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, people can call 911 and receive EMS services. Um, one of our challenges is right now we don't have a lot of options. Um, our options are to take that person to the hospital, emergency department, or to leave them at home. Um, there's not, there's not, those are quite often not the right options. Right. So as we hopefully expand what we can do in the world of mobile integrated health, uh, we can provide other alternatives such as uh, mental health counseling, um, substance abuse coaching. And I don't have to explain to anybody here that going to an emergency room is an extremely expensive proposition, mm -hmm. 10 times more than cost to go to a community health center. Let me detour a little bit. Beyond it's expensive, it's also our emergency departments are overflowing. There, there are people that are waiting days there That's just right. to get out of the emergency department. So the rooms that would normally be available for us EMS, we are now forced to sit on a wall for hours on end, wait just to get our patients in the door. Is that right? Yes, sir. And what is that? Is that because of drugs it's, and? It's because of psychiatric illness. Yeah. It's because of uh, overburden of our healthcare system that is seeing more and more patients that are seeing sicker and sicker. And it's our hospitals that are just at max capacity and cannot afford. Emergency yeah. departments are the funnel for the system, Senator. You know, uh, if you can't get an appointment at your doctor's office, know, you go to the emergency know, room, right? And know, it's easy and it's fast and it's simple. And I think what Scott's talking about is exactly that. Yeah. I, I think the other point that I wanted to make is that you mentioned before about healthcare systems, and I think what we're describing to you is integrating into that healthcare right. system instead right. of being the standalone red-headed stepchild of the healthcare system, we need to be part of that. And that's not... I wish there was a system that you could yeah. be part of. That's part of the problem. And that's not incongruent with the fire departments either, because there's fire departments that are doing good work on that front as well. All right, let me ask you this. We put a lot of money in the state into expanding community health centers. Do you have any involvement with them? Are they playing any role in this? Should they be playing a, a, a more active role? Thoughts, Mike? Any... any? The only area that it could that it doesn't help today is Medicare only pays to go to a hospital. You may be able to have them take some less uh, acute patients when they're open if we were able to be paid to take them there. Okay. So you are, that's an interesting point, Scott. I didn't realize that, that you're having a hard time getting the care, you pay, the immediate care your patients need because the ERs are... Well, uh, let me, can I add to that? Yeah. So one of the other challenges that uh, we face in all of our community hospitals is when you have a, a serious illness, you have to go to a, a higher level of care. Okay, so this is what, Dartmouth? Yeah. Well, you would think, uh, but because we've had, had such a, a shortage in the uh, hospital staffing areas, quite often we're headed to Connecticut, uh, Maine Medical Center in Portland, out into West You're New taking York. people to Portland, Maine? Those are the closest available beds in our healthcare system. So that's taking ambulances and crews um, that are out of service now for six, eight hours at a time. Not to mention if I'm a patient, I'm not necessarily want to be banging along to yes. Maine, right? So, you know, the, the ripple effect from our healthcare system onto the ambulance services is huge as well. Right. So Dartmouth is unable to accommodate some of your needs? Quite often Dartmouth. Um, so we go to Albany Medical Center a lot. Um, Albany is one where we quite often wait two hours to unload our patients. Um, like I said, Hartford, Connecticut is is a daily occurrence for us. Bridgeport, Connecticut. Really? So, um, and again, that has a huge effect on our ability to serve the rest of our patients. I'd like to echo on one thing that Dan just said at the end, um, in that we, and I'd like to say, if we want to do bolt strokes, especially at the federal level, we need to be have EMS recognized as an essential service. 
and some of it may be just words, but those words really matter to us. Uh, law enforcement, firefighting are all essential parts of our public safety. EMS is an essential You're part right. of public safety and our health, and yet we feel like, in especially our local ambulance services that are scrambling. Personally, I'm selling Christmas trees to get two to three dollars to to fundraise, um, just to make things meet. Uh, these are not sustainable products, and so if we want bold strokes, we need to be recognized as an essential service, and then fund and recognize and support our EMS office, uh, give that and them the opportunity of staff to be able to do these broad strokes and leadership. Right now, they're the, low, the smallest EMS office in New England. And uh, nothing to against their hard work people, but they really could use some help. I don't have to tell anybody here that in the midst of all of this, you're living in a country that spends twice as much per person on health care as any other country on earth. I think we can agree at how that money is spent. It's not where it's going, it's insurance companies, drug companies, not particularly rational. All right, Danielle, you've been silent. This is a young lady we did a video with, what, a couple of years ago, yeah, right? Two, two years ago today, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, we were struck by Danielle. We, we bumped into her, and uh, I think my staff did. And, uh, you know, we're trying to attract young people into uh, volunteer fire departments, EMS stuff, and, and Danielle struck us as somebody who was very excited about the work she was doing. Why don't you, how does the world look from your perspective, Danielle? Um, well, not just being a volunteer firefighter, I'm also a registered nurse in Middlebury at Porter Medical Center now. Fantastic. And it is really sad seeing the people flow into the emergency rooms, and we've maxed out down there. And I'm on the med surge floor, and seeing people have to get treated in the hallways, and when they finally do wait a few days to get up to our floor, which we can hold 25, and that is if we have an adequate amount of nurses up there. And by the time you get up to Porter in the med surge unit, many times they have to be transferred up to UVM, and that's only if UVM can take them. I had a patient recently that was needing to go to a higher level of care, and the wait time was 24 to 48 hours, which is horrible for someone that's life's on the line. Um, but I've been a firefighter for a few years, but I started when I was 15 in the cadet program, thanks to men like them over there. Um, it was scary to start out and not knowing what you're doing. I don't have a parent on the fire department, so I really just kind of dropped in. Uh, it was actually after cheerleading practice. <laughs> I had my mom drop me off at my first meeting that I could. Um, and it's, it's really critical to have someone take you under your wing, especially when you don't have a family member on the fire department. And I know that in a lot of trainings, they try to start you off at like the, the, the bottom of the line because I had no idea what I was getting into. But I think it would be really critical to have more cadet programs where you're in a training with other people that also have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> uh, it's a lot less scary. Did your involvement with the fire department end up influencing your decision to become a nurse? Um, I actually wanted to be a nurse because I was a patient in the hospital. Uh, I'm not sure what made me want to be a firefighter. I honestly think you guys were really cool. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, uniform. <laughs> so you the uniform. Um, and I did an eighth grade challenge. You got to just study anything, and I chose volunteer firefighting. So then I knocked on the doors of the New Haven Fire Volunteer Fire Department when I was 15. But Mark, are we having uh, success in, in reaching out to young people? I think we are. I mean, we're seeing, <clears throat> interestingly enough, the smallest demographic in the fire service right now is that under 21 age group. So we're working hard at trying to, to raise that. Uh, programs like the Cadet Academy, which you experienced, you know, we're trying to grow that. And Dean and Peeker in the room and can, can attest to that. Um, infusing that money that you secured for, for the, that program is going to be a help. Uh, we see a lot of students start in those cadet programs and then continue on in either fire or EMS or some other, you know, law, even sometimes law enforcement. It's just hooking them into emergency services, giving them that exposure. And we see them c continue that into adulthood. Um, so Do, so those are all good things. Are you getting into schools to talk to kids about the opportunities that are available? Um, we're, we're not. We need to, that's an avenue that we need to, to start approaching. Um, interestingly enough, um, you know, a lot of folks uh, think that the, the answer is um, technical centers. And um, we've had some struggles in technical centers because um, in Vermont um, there's such a large volunteer uh, force in the fire service that it doesn't help them achieve their goal of career placement. 
Um, so there's there's so there are so many fewer um, career positions, career opportunities for firefighters in Vermont that um, that hasn't been one of the big targets of the technical centers. Um, but I mean, as uh, Chief Reed can attest, we're seeing. I think right now we're seeing more fire service career opportunities than I've seen in the last 20 years in Vermont. So it's growing and it's becoming more popular. <clears throat> but we need to find those people that, you know, we all know that the age of Vermonters is increasing and that's, you know, as a small town fire chief, I can tell you, I've knocked on so many doors, we need more people in the age group that can serve. We need to grow the workforce. Very true. So that, I mean, that's, that's the focus, you know. Oh, are we reaching out to young women as well? Absolutely. Yeah. And we're starting to see increases in the numbers of, of women registered in our entry level programs, which is good. And that has continued to climb over the last several years. So we're we're we are seeing some successes in, in pulling women into the fire service. I think you made a good point with the technical schools because they actually stopped offering it when I got into high school. But I wanted to be a nurse and I knew I didn't want to be a firefighter to get paid for it. I wanted to be a volunteer firefighter, so why would I waste my like class time for something volunteering when I had to go into biology and Latin to become a nurse and but there needs to be something like after school and I know I've mentioned before if we could have enough training hours for those cadets that they could get an incentive to not have to do physical education or something like that just so that they can still get like the training hours aren't just adding up for the fire department but they can get some kind of incentive for that in another way so we opened a uh, EMS training academy down in southern Vermont last year and we have our first uh, oh, cohort. Where? Uh, Front of New Fane, Vermont. So uh, Vermont EMS Academy down there. And we have our first cohort of high school students this year. Wonderful. And they're doing it as um, for credit as part of their education program. Um, so they could then every day. Was it hard to week. attract them? or? Uh, it was very easy. Um, so we're, uh, we're looking forward to the outcome of this program and another. I mean, what's great about that is the immediate uh, problems that you're helping to address, but also getting young people into healthcare. I mean, as you've indicated, we don't have enough nurses, we don't have enough doctors, we don't have enough paramedics. To get young people interested in healthcare in general is a major step forward. And if you get it, someone hooked when they're 15, 16, right. they're going to want to keep going. I've been on the fire department for now 10 years, and it's just kind of getting your foot in the door because it's a lot harder to start something when you're older, when you. I, I want it, like, but know. we got to build a system to keep them. It, it, it's it doesn't. God bless them, and uh, uh, nurses are wonderful. But I want to build a system where a person who decides they want to be an EMS provider or a firefighter says, "I can get a job. I can keep a job. I can make a living wage. I can have benefits. I don't have to work ten jobs to do this." That's another important piece of this as well. And we need an educational program that is free for cost. Um, our firefighting program at the Vermont State Fire Academy is free and you can get all the students in. Our EMS academies are not. And that is an impediment right, to... So if I want to be, how much is it going to cost me? $1,200 to $1,500 for the right, entry This level. is what we're trying to address with mm -hmm. Wilson, right? Exactly. Right. 12, 12 to $1,500 just to get an EMT license. Um, all right, we're beginning to try to address that. Perfect. Right. And I appreciate your help on that. I really do. You know, what drives me crazy, I've got to tell you, when we sit around the table, is it's clear we don't have a system. All right, nobody in the world would deny that the work you're doing is enormously important. And yet sometimes you're going out and doing something, you don't get compensated a nickel for doing it, right? You're paying people 16 bucks an hour to do very important work. We're not training the young people that we need. All right, we need to really be thinking immediately, but we need to be thinking big term. Big, is the state... Uh, appreciating these problems and addressing them in the bold way do you think is there some yeah i mean listen everybody that works at the state offices of ems providers come up through the system they understand this as much as anybody i think the challenge of course senator is there isn't a simple lever to pull or a switch to flip to make it better um uh you know uh, there's not if it was simple we would have fixed it already um but uh, you know i think i think so i think we're making some strides um it's complicated, unfortunately. Yeah, it is, it is, it is. All right, other thoughts. Dean, you've been... Senator, oh, thinking of the younger people, you know, the cadet programs, I think one of our biggest uh, drawbacks is they go out and train with their local fire department, and they're going to do ventilation tonight, and all they can do is stand back and watch the ventilation being done. They're not allowed because of their age to actually do the ventilation. Um, we take up somebody using a chainsaw in a forestry class, 
at the age of 16, um, they're allowed to use that because it's educational. But as a firefighter, they're not allowed to, to do it because it's occupational. Um, so we need to change that. And we, we've, been, we've brought this up many times with the state. Um, it just, it needs, we need to be able to let, train them the same way that we're being trained. Because um, sometimes you lose them yep. because they are being yep. set aside to watch everything. And they want to do hands-on. Danielle may want to jump into this discussion, but I think we underutilize our young people. I think there are a lot of young people who want more responsibility, and we don't give it to them. We treat them like Correct. little kids, and they're not. They're adults and uh, who can help, who will enjoy doing the real work and, and help the community doing it. I don't think we take advantage of them as much as we should. So that's a good point, and that's... That, that was the problem with the career centers. They'd take the course, and then they couldn't test out for Firefighter 1 until they turned 18 because they weren't, by state law, they're not allowed to run power equipment or be involved with live fire. It's actually an OSHA regulation. This is a federal regulation? It's an OSHA regulation and OSHA follows it. And when you're 16, two years is a lifetime, you know, so you find something else to do before exactly. you get Can you got you know that one? All right. They're not going to want to sit around and no, wait. I, I, believe me, I got it. Yeah. You show up to a car accident and you're told to stand up on the bank because <laughs> you can't go near the person or at a even just a training, you smoke out a building, you're out on there on the edge doing nothing. <laughs> Which is discouraging and yeah, kind of insulting in a way. When you show up to, to help, to do something, to learn, and you're told to just sit there. We so, do the same thing in our EMS licensure. Uh, the 18-year-old requirement, they can't become an EMT until they're 18. They can't even test until they're 18. The National Registry will not allow that either. So we, we face the same battles on the EMS side of educating these individuals getting them empowered at 16 and 17 and then asking them to wait till their 18th birthday to finally test out. Uh, Katie we on? I, well, I shouldn't, I'm sorry, I should, Katie Van Hayes is hey, our state director and Heli Perro does our outreach work. Uh, Katie, I, uh, or Heli, do you want to jump into this, anything on your mind? Heli, Heli's been getting a hold around the state. What 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 do you think, Heli? Hey, come on up here. Um. I think a lot of what you said, that there's a lot of challenges, but a lot of untapped opportunity. I think I was hearing from Drew about kind of what EMS can do, and I know fire is similar, uh, really beyond sort of what we traditionally have thought of as, as EMS and fire. And folks that when there's an emergency like COVID um, or even the flooding, I know that it was folks like you all who are out in communities. So I think cr thinking creatively and then also thinking about how we pay you for it. Um, and then really interested in, in getting young folks involved and people seeing themselves um, as someone who can join a fire department. I think what Danielle said about if you don't have that family connection, how do you knock on that door? I know you did Operation May Day to try to encourage folks, but really just making it um, very approachable and real for people. Was that successful Operation May Day? It was for the first year. For the first year out of the gate, um, we did an early survey after that event, and we counted. Um, over 30 new responders entered the entered, That's good. entered the fire service. That's so good. for the first year, it was so. Um, and Are I we working it, with you on that, or uh, we Haley helped us do some outreach to get to spread the word. We have, and, you know, we have a thing. I don't know if you're familiar with. It, it's called Bernie Buzz, which gets around the state. I think we have 150,000 people on the list. Not and the Bernie Buzz did advertise this. Did okay. Yes. So uses if you think there's something that would be of uh, use statewide, we're there to, to try to work with you. Senator, there's two grant programs too that are critical to the fire service. AFG, right, which today grant becomes open, safer, right? Safer, yeah. Um, so I know with the continuing resolution, sometimes mm -hmm. things are up in the air, but reauthorization and, and well, it'll happen. Those are All right, it, but it's totally. Tools. But what is the what's wow. the federal uh, contribution? How much is after in AFG? Uh, how much? How much is? How big is that pot? Do you recall? Anyway. I think it's 360 million for Something each. Something like that. And 360 each? Yeah. yeah, and usually the local cost share, depending on population, is 5%. 5%. So it's a pretty yeah. good. Yeah. Pretty so good we, we ended up applying for a safer grant. Just, you know, we, we've recognized staffing is such a crisis right. in the state. So we put in for a safer grant, and we weren't successful, unfortunately. We made it through peer review, it just didn't go on to technical review. But you know, like the city of Philadelphia, you got $22 million. We're asking for 800000 I know. I one know. firefighter per I know, shift. I know, I know. It gets frustrating. So, the, you know, continuing right. those programs. We have had, I think, some luck in Vermont. <coughs> yes, mm -hmm. some departments have received grants. Yes, that's right. All right. Yeah. Here's what we're trying to do there. 
we had, some of you were involved. Do you remember a couple of years ago we were on the phone with the fire administrator after Biden came in? We begged them. Uh, and I think we ended up having some success, I mean, given the bureaucracy there. If you are a small department, filling out these forms is like impossible, right? Ten Philadelphia to can much. do it. Yeah. 10 to 30 hours of work. Right. For people who don't necessarily have the training, have other work, right? Right. Mm -hmm. you know. uh, we begged them uh, to simplify the process. I think they did, yes, a little bit. A little bit, and they've created this micro grant program yeah. as well. So, so explain that. Okay. So there's a, no. as many of you, you yeah. might know. Why don't you guys sit up here? <laughs> a micro grant program yeah. um, that has been around, and this year they increased the maximum to 75,000. So again, this grant program that's a little more accessible, can sometimes be regional, uh, now has more money in it. So it's not limited to, I think, previously 50,000. Yeah. But anything you can do to make the program bigger. Because Absolutely. there were 8,000 applicants last year, less than 10 awards in Vermont. I know. And Which probably was good for Vermont, by the way, 10 awards. Relatively speaking, it was good for the, for the ten that received them. Right, but no way near enough. I know. Yeah, that. is is it still limited to two percent for EMS? Yes. Yeah. So and know, that's why EMS again being eighty percent of the call volume, <laughs> getting two percent of the money. And after that discussion online, um, the center introduced a bill to create essentially an AFG program for EMS because there's a need across the board for fire and EMS instead of competing against them. And we try to put some money, I think, into the um, primary care bill as well. Mm -hmm. One of the struggles for fire, fire departments, municipal fire departments, and, and where they differ a little bit from EMS, is EMS can bill for their services. We don't bill for our services. So we're strictly funded by taxpayer dollars. So um, there is a revenue stream for EMS to recover some of their costs. It doesn't it's not enough for sure, but that's fire. There is a difference. The um, EMS and fire gets the bill. If you had an ambulance, you'd bill. Yeah, so if making sure it's not that different, you know. And if fire departments had the ambulance service, they would be able to bill for some of those services, but standalone fire departments don't have that. So you're competing for tax money that is really a struggle in some of these small communities when you add in the school budgets and the highway funds and all that stuff. So it's it's that's, pretty, pretty that's much a, a double-edged sword, though, too, in that for us standalone EMS agencies, our select boards look at our, hey, you can get revenue, so I'm going to focus tax dollars on those in, in, entities, or law enforcement, or firefighting, and other uh, priorities of the town that can't get revenue. I'm going to focus on really trying to increase them, and you can go find your revenues in your reimbursements. Well, we know reimbursements for Medicaid and Medicare are really challenging and nowhere near equate to what we need operationally. So it's a dual-edged sword. I, I'm not Scott, talk about reimbursement. Remind me again. I know that you got the private, you got uh, Medicaid, Medicare, all different. That's correct. Our private is the best, is the highest reimbursement rate? We, unfortunately, to try to shift the amount of money that we can get in from Medicare and Medicaid, we have to shift our costs to private insurance so they can pay more so that we can just fund and put the lights on. Um, we are fortunate to have our Medicaid rates um, increased locally in our state legislature, so I want to call out all the hard work there, but that hasn't solved the problem, um, and that's only a temporary stopgap. And Medicare? Medicare, and Drew can speak better um, to this number. I'm not sure if it's 55% or 60% of what normal private insurance would would pay. And we are forced to come up with 35, 40% of that funds from somewhere else. Taxpayers, fundraisers, somewhere we have to do to pay the lights up to stay on. And 60 to 70% of your business is Medicare and Medicaid. Medicaid. Oh, is that right? Patients. Yes. So you're talking about 70% of your patients on Medicare and Medicaid. And some have no so insurance. Re okay. It's really hard to make up the That's difference. It. Okay, and then some have no insurance at all. No, no, and I also wanted to make sure I mentioned that I uh, appreciate you being the major co-sponsor and working with Senator Welsh to pay for the trips that we talked about that we don't transport. Right. But just, you know, when we talked about you're writing off 20 to 30 percent for people who can't pay, 30 percent of your call volume, 20 to 30 percent more of your call volume is going to and not transporting. And this is tri the trifecta that's impacting us of mental health, drug abuse, and homelessness. It's all 
all relative of the new in Vermont then. impacting our bottom line and making the when we call we show up whether they pay or not we will transport always all right always. so all right let's talk about the trifecta and you know you all know it's it's bad in Vermont it's worse than many other parts of the country all right let's talk about I mean this drug thing is is horrible uh, and I guess you're on the front lines of dealing with that. All right, give me some examples of what you're experiencing. Yeah. So sometimes you know, we, we talk about the, the impact on, on the people that are suffering from addiction. Um, I want to just kind of highlight the impact on the healthcare workers that are managing it. Um, it's not uncommon for us to see the same patient uh, repeatedly. And, um, you know, just a personal story after doing CPR on the same person, uh, four times um, to show up too late the fifth time um, and see this person that we've tried to get into the system. We've literally gone through the, the motions of resuscitating them, taking them to the hospital um, to see them over and over again. And really the, the end of that is, you know, on, on number five, we, were, we weren't called early enough and it was a negative outcome. So there's a huge impact not only on the, the people that are, are suffering from addiction, but everybody in the room and the, and the staff that we represent that are going out there every day is seeing these patients over and over again. All right, let me pick up on Drew's, and that's a very important point, Drew. I mean, we do we talk about how we deal with the addict, but we're not talking about how we deal with the folks who every day are out there trying to address the problem. Does what Drew said resonate? Very much so. All right, Scott? I can recall an instance just recently where my crew responded to a mental health uh, patient who de decided to ingest cocaine and took on my local law enforcement officer and they assaulted each other for over 25 minutes and we were having to get uh, our EMS crews get involved and get injured just to be able to safely transport this patient who only in turn after three and a half hours was discharged from our emergency oh, department and re-abused for cocaine and called 911 system. So that same crew that was just assaulted, oh God. just injured, had to go back and take care of this guy again, where he is again swinging at EMS providers. This is the system that we're asking people to join, to people to stay in, to retain. I, I don't know how that's sustainable, personally. All right, further. Um I, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'll ask it anyway. Do we have uh, the kind of treatment available for that person who OD'd on four occasions? So that is it so if somebody is ODing and ODing, what do we do? The patient we, has to make the choice themselves in order to get the help. We can't force them right. you know, to make that choice. I know in rural areas, these are people we know on a first name basis when we go to see them, like Drew said, you know, in, in Waterbury, the police force that we have are coming from the state police and so they could be two and a half hours away at three in the morning when we're going give me an example maggie of what you're dealing with yeah we go to a patient who um, has overdosed and they call 911 we go and we say hey is there where are they home now or home? yep is are they've overdosed yep. somebody's called 911 yep. what happens are there police available that can come follow us they're aware that it's it's happening and um they're going to send someone when they can and so our crews then will stage and wait until it's safe for them to enter the home to take care of that patient. Wow. The, the, Which is not good health care, I presume, huh? The other thing from the outside looking in, I don't do any EMS, but um, from I'm on the select board in our community and our police chief says the biggest, the only place to send people in mental health crisis is to call the ambulance and send them to the hospital. And then when they get there, there's no treatment for you them. got it and like she says they're right back home and and within hours you're dealing with the same thing again the ceo at uvm will tell you they don't have the capabilities they just sit in the emergency room for exactly days yeah. and days because there's no room days. for places and when they put them to a room it's enormously expensive and they don't have the mm -hmm. capability of treating people Adults what about brattleboro is, is the retreat doing much now or retreat treats very uh very busy we actually have a partnership with the retreat in order to help um, oh, they, i know they went through difficult times yeah they're they're back up to about 100 beds now um like i said we work with the retreat um every day of the week to help get patients that are stuck in emergency departments around the state so we'll actually go out with ambulances and transport uh, those patients into the retreat to try to bring the uh, amount of time that they're waiting in er's down 
Um, we've been successful at, at cutting the uh, ER wait times once they're accepted from about 20 hours down to about eight hours, um, but that's still a long time, um, even after being accepted for mental health treatment. Is Katie Dwyer called it Southwest Hospital in Bennington was building some, were they thinking of building some capacity as well? Yes, I believe that that is Is that true? Correct. Down in, yeah. in Bennington? <laughs> Excuse me, Senator, I was just gonna add, I think there's opportunity here for EMS and fire as well. Uh, first of all, um, I think we have to seize these opportunities when we have a more intimate relationship with these folks who are overdosing and in psychological crisis than perhaps any other arm of the healthcare service. So we need to be able to make that connection immediately. It's absurd to think that we're going to give you uh, a narcotic antagonist that is to block your your overdose put you into withdrawals and then say, okay, see you later, right. right? We've got to be able to do something to either connect you to treatment services, to connect you to detox, connect you to something. Do we have, does anyone here think we have any way near the capability no. that we need? But, but I think there's an opportunity. Um, we've begun, we will begin very soon, uh, an EMS buprenorphine project uh, where our ambulances are carrying uh, medication assisted, uh, medication uh, uh, to assist this moment. Um, so I think that's a piece that's there. I mentioned before about the connection to treatment right away. Right? We, we can't say, call me back in five days to get treatment. We've got to say, this is rock bottom. Here's somebody that can help you. And these peer review, co these peer coachings are exceptionally important in that time. They're there saying, hey, we're here and we're ready. Let's go. Uh, if you don't seize that. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is that I think there's an opportunity, especially around psychological crisis, to begin to triage where these folks go, how we respond to them. Uh, Senator, if you and I sat in an ER for four days, as sane as we might be, we will be. Well, talk for yourself. Time, I, right? I don't want to. <laughs> but the point is, nobody can exist in that environment. And, and, what, and our response is generally escalating the situation. So we're working on some creative solutions to try to, uh, for example, with Drew's team down at the, um, what's the barracks down there? Uh, Westminster. Yeah. Westminster Barracks. We're triaging people who call for a mental health crisis to say, look, is it the appropriate resource to send state police, which sometimes it is, mm -hmm. is it an appropriate resource mm -hmm. to send EMS, or is it a more appropriate resource to, to send you over to 988, the suicide hotline? In fact, we have a meeting this afternoon to talk about just that. How do we put that intervention point into our call taking system to say, look, if we can have you talk to a clinician that's mm -hmm. better trained, more appropriately trained, let's get you out of this And a number cycle. of police departments are beginning to do that. Yep. Was, for example, the state police, we just put, we're going to put 12 new healthcare right, workers into our barracks next year. So I think there's opportunities. I think, I think and EMS and fire can play an important role in that. All right, other thoughts? Senator, oh, I'd just like to, uh, first I would like to say thank you for uh, what you do for us, uh, but uh, thank you also for what Haley does for us. Mm -hmm. Haley has, is well respected uh, throughout the state in the fire service and I'm sure the EMS and we're, we're super agree with that. Hour, so, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question is, is over the years we've introduced uh, on the federal level several bills. We were in Shelburne that we did a um, um, benefits type thing that we introduced um, and we've always included Although it doesn't say EMS, we've included first responders so that it didn't include EMS. But we don't seem to, and there's been other uh, states that had their senators or representatives introduce bills for the fire service and EMS. They just don't seem to go anywhere. What can we do to, to push these things? I mean, See, we're going to get arrested if we show up on the, on the floor. I'm <laughs> pretty sure of that. So. I don't want to get political here. No, I really don't. But there are some folks who I'd rather give tax breaks to billionaires and large corporations than fund the enormously important work you're doing. And the irony here is this is not just a Vermont issue. I suspect there are 49 other states that are dealing with exactly the same issues. Rural health, you know, we talk about the health care crisis, rural health is even worse. Uh, and who is the backbone of rural health? It's what you guys all over the country are doing, right? So the irony is, you talk about this and everyone nods their head and their support. All, right, all, all I can tell you, Dean, is we're going to stay on it and, and do our best in, in all respects. 
Uh, the SAFER program is inadequately funded. The AFG program is inadequately funded. The EMS stuff is inadequately funded. Uh, yeah, Dan, uh, Jim. Just, just wanted to see if possibly rural states have a lot of power in, in Congress and seem to do well, and that's in, on your favor is on yeah. our favor. You're also a very powerful chair of the Health Committee, Health Education. Is there maybe some hearings where you could get people to support yep. some things that yep. we could get the word out? Yep. I mean, how they know it, but if you could get them to come. I mean, together. hearings are good, but that you got to go. Be, yeah, and, and the answer is yes. And I'm sure we can get folks not only from Vermont, but your compatriots from all over the country to That's make right. the case and put pressure on the Congress to act. So it's a good idea, and I think it's something uh, we can do. Um, but we'll also need the help of your national organizations, because I am correct, I know, in saying this is a national problem. Not, it is. It's not just a Vermont problem, especially for rural states. Uh, I, we talked a little bit about drugs being a new, and a, not new, but a significantly increased uh, crisis for you guys, right? Mental health. COVID play a role in that, do you think? Is that, was that a stimulator? What, what's going on with mental health? Why do we see so much? You know, I go into the schools occasionally, and the kids will acknowledge that they are dealing with a lot of stress and anxiety. Danielle, is that true? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, if you don't get to be around your peers and you're not stimulated and you're not used to that schedule that you knew for the last however so many years, it does play a big role. And when you have to go into a house and you have to like gown up and be scared of what you're walking into, and I mean, it does. It adds a whole other factor of stress. Okay, what is on your minds that we did not discuss? And we've gone over a lot of stuff. So uh, kind of a move towards regional departments, uh -huh. uh, at, at least discussions about that are starting to come up. That makes sense to you? It does to me. Um, spreading out the resources over a larger population. Yep. Um, to the extent there is something that could be done more long term, maybe a discussion about how we could how the federal government or... Well, that's not so much a federal... I mean, federal government is money, but how that money is... How they could... How it's, how you know, it's the structure of how, who gets the money, that's that's the state's decision. We are, right. we are no great secret, we we're not into county government very much yet. Right. But, you know, I can tell you, you know, you got Winooski over there and you got South Burlington and all three separate entities, really, five minutes apart from each other. Makes sense? Yeah. I'm not so sure it does. I think there's creative ideas, though, Senator, and I don't think it's entirely incongruent to think about it in the way we think about health care from a federal level. We have FQHCs. We have critical access hospitals that are federally funded. Um, I don't have a mature thought on it, but I, but I think there's a, a process to think about it in that way of of here we have an expensive resource that we're simply not able to pay for at some of these most rural places. How do we scaffold that in a way that it's sustainable? I'm not saying that it can you know be entirely underwritten, but we do it in other arms of healthcare, uh, and maybe that's something to be thinking about in EMS as well. Brad touched on regionalization. It's a conversation that we've had for quite a while now at different levels. And I think that we're starting to do it without calling it that because everybody has their own little kingdom. That's our biggest problem is we all have our own little kingdom and we don't want you coming into our kingdom and telling us what to do. Um, so regionalization is, is a tough pill to swallow, but I think it's the only way that we're gonna be able to afford to be able to have fire service and EMS in the future. Right. Uh, Homeland Security was probably one of our biggest flaws in that everybody got the same toys. So now we don't need you, you know, where we might have used Brad's department to come in and assist us because they had a, a, a certain expertise. Now we have got the money through home, Homeland Security to get the material to run that and we, we don't have the ability or we don't have the people to staff it so we're no further ahead and then once that um, piece of equipment is no longer viable we have to figure out how we're going to fund it again if we want to keep that going and i see that as a you know 
one of the biggest things was 9-11 uh, uh, being able to communicate across lines and we're no further ahead really? on our communication than we were when that happened. I mean, it is, it is terrible and we have these discussions all the time and we don't know the answers. But I think we're moving, as the cost goes up, I think we're moving more towards regionalization and, and understanding that we don't all need all the toys. Um, you know, the cost of, a cost of a new pumper is, is upwards of $500,000 now. You know, how do you, you know, I was mayor of the city a long time ago, and that was one of the shocks that I discovered. Yeah. <laughs> God, it was expensive. It's worse I think now. regionalization could be formal and informal, and um, a formal model like Drew's model that he's using down south. But I think there's also informal models, such as up here in Chinook County, where the local entity agency may be able to get its first uh, EMS call out the door with its ambulance but the next call coming in is probably pulling in the town from over. And that happens dozens upon dozens times every single day. And that it's a web of individual organizations, but they've de thought, decided to help all of each other out in the name of mutual aid. And that's essentially a regionalized right. model. Right. So I don't think it formally needs to have the big old agency come in. Sometimes there's other local options that can achieve that. But I think that's what we're trying to achieve. One last thing I want to call out is the healthcare and wellness of the individual responder. Um, retention is great and important, but if they get that one call which drives them out the door, that could be decades of learning, education, and expertise that we will not be able to replace. Um, Do we have the counseling and the help for that individual? I think on the short term, maybe. On the long term, I'm not so sure. We, we have it, but getting us, getting me to admit that I have that weakness is the first problem. Getting me to admit that a call bothered me and that, that I want to sit and talk with you to tell me about it. Peer support is a, is a big thing that we're pushing to, you know, tell your members to talk to the person that was at the call with you and, and, and get it out. Well, you guys see a lot of dreadful stuff, huh? I think every one of us that sits around this table knows at least one person, probably more, that have left emergency services because of their mental health. Yes. Because of what they've experienced. Because of what they've the experienced job. and how and how uh, there wasn't a mechanism for them to manage that. And it's a thousand paper cuts too, right? I mean, it's not always the awful and tragic call. It's the awful and tragic calls plus low wages, plus long hours, plus getting up in the middle of the night. I mean, it's it's not one thing, it's a lot of things, and they well, all you know, are cumulative. Four agencies to make ends meet, mm -hmm. each of those getting up at 3 a.m. in the morning only to turn over to get to the next agency to try to keep, keep my bills paid. And losing people to that doesn't help our personnel crisis. Right. right. I mean, we can't afford to lose those people. Not, you know, beyond that, we can't afford for them to, to leave feeling that way because that, that's just the start of what they're going to experience in their life. And the public can't afford to have us lose them. And I think we have seen a culture shift for the younger generation coming in, being more cognizant of mental health, talking about it, being more open about it, and how can we support financially those individuals coming up that will be more open and will help advocate for that for us as an industry. And the pity of it is, it's not that as a nation we're not spending enough money. We're spending a whole lot of money. It's how we're spending it. We don't spend it on prevention. We don't spend it on primary care. We don't spend it on the work you're doing. You know. But if I end up in the hospital and some surgery, I can come out with a million dollar bill, right? A million dollars go a long way in your department, right? <laughs> And not just the $100,000 trucks, is that like my fire department right now, we only have a handful of interior firefighters and I'm one of them and my gear is older than <coughs> I mean, we can't afford to go buy brand new gear. And how many years is it that it even lasts for? Seven Ten years. Like, seven years. that's crazy for a fire department that has it. We only have about 400 people in my town right now. But if someone's house catches on fire, that's still a house that's caught on fire if the town has thousands of people. I mean, and it's scary to think that if a tone goes out right now and I put on my gear and you're going into a house that has scary chemicals and I don't have the right gear, I mean, then I'm just putting my own health on line just to end up in the hospital. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then I have to call this guy to come get me because I'm no longer healthy. And 
take you to Connecticut. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. I prefer Maine, though. But. <laughs> all right, I think we have probably raised more questions than provided answers, but all right, let me just say this. Uh, if you think the problems are overwhelming, you're not crazy, they are. Uh, if you think the system is irrational, you're right. If you think we're spending the money where we shouldn't be and not spending it where we should be, you're right. If you think Congress is not addressing these issues, you're right. Maybe the state legislature is doing better, I don't know. But uh, all right, all that I can tell you is this. Number one, from the bottom of my heart, and I know I probably speak for everybody in the state of Vermont, all 640,000 of us, thank you very much for what you're doing. All right, and you are heroes and heroines, and you don't get the recognition that you do, and you're doing it every day under great stress, so thank you. And some of us, not, not just me, but some of us are more than aware of the issues that we have discussed, and we're trying. We're trying. I mean, we just a few months ago brought forth a bipartisan primary health care bill, which would have gone a long way to, to address some of the problems we're talking about. Couldn't quite get the support that we needed, so we'll have to come down and do much less than I wanted. But some of us are aware of this, and we're trying. So I want you to know that. that don't think it's what you're experiencing is not perceived by some of us in Congress. And your delegation, uh, Becker and Peter, I think, are there with me. Um, all right, anything else that anyone want to raise? Just thank you to you, too, and your staff for supporting us. Oh, you got it. Well, it's my honor to support you because you guys are doing great work. It really is, and it's a pleasure to work with people who are doing the great work that you're doing. All right, there's a lot of stuff we're trying. We're making some progress. Uh, we're going to stay with it. Uh, we'll continue communicating, tell you what we're doing, hearing from you. Uh, but um, uh, maybe last word, Maggie, the program that you're working with, Dr. Wilson, is going well? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about it. So we're in week two. Um, it's a program that's been in existence for several years in upstate New York um, to meet the needs of those in rural areas. So it's an online, so we're in person on Fridays from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, and we've got four different classrooms on the screen in front of us. So there's. And it's inexpensive. That training is reasonably inexpensive? Yeah. I believe that I've been told that the cost is going to be covered so that it's not going good. to cost. That's the money anything. that we got. Okay. Yeah, good. And that's what we want. Wanna... All right. So the idea, I mean, of all the crazy things, the idea that people want to do the right thing, have to spend, what, a couple of thousand dollars to get DMP training? Up to twenty-seven to thirty-two thousand dollars, Senator. For the paramedic program, paramedic program, paramedic program to forty-five. Yeah. Does that make any sense to anybody? I mean, it's it's unbelievable. All right. So, all right. We're trying. We've got an enormous amount of work in front of us, and let's keep working together. Thank you all for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.